Good morning. morning. Let's open this morning's service with hymn number 37 from the hardback hymnal, number 37, How Great Thou Art. Let's all stand together. God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, 
and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. How great a God we serve. We have no ability to comprehend the fullness of his greatness. One day we'll see him as he is. What a day that'll be. We were talking this morning about people that are all caught up in fear over over this uh, hurricane. And I said, for those who are in Christ, uh, the worst case scenario will be the best day of their life. And uh, that's that's our hope, isn't it? That's our hope. We do have friends in the Bahamas, and I know there's people dying down there right now with a Cat 5 sitting over top of them. I uh, talked to Margaret uh, this morning. She's got a good bit of family down there. So, um. <clears throat> The wind listeth with us wherever it wills. Our God is in control of it as he is in control of the salvation of his people. For so it is with everyone that's born of the Spirit. And what the Lord said to Nicodemus. So these, uh, these storms remind us of who's in control. I remember hearing a preacher say one time, wasn't a gospel preacher, he was a false prophet, but he was talking about the devastation of a hurricane. He said, well, God didn't have anything to do with that. Now, he's got everything to do with it, doesn't he? Everything. Let's uh, go before the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings on our time together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, what great hope and joy we have in knowing that you delight in showing mercy. Lord, we are mercy beggars. We have nothing to offer you but our sin and we plead Lord that you, that for Christ's sake that you would look to him and his shed blood and that we would know that when you see the blood that you will pass over us Lord we we thankful we're thankful for the for the revelation of of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Lord, we are not capable of comprehending it, but we pray that your Holy Spirit would give us faith to believe on him and to rest our hope in his sufficient substitutionary sacrifice for sinners. Lord, we, uh, we know that you are the one that controls the the winds and the storms and the sea and Lord we pray that you would be merciful and uh, we ask Lord that you would give us uh, hope and rest and faith to trust you in whatever you see fit for we ask it in Christ's name Amen <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles together to Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13, I've titled this message, Two Fires. Two Fires. Every single person born in this world will experience one of two fires. One fire will be a fire to go through. The other fire will be one to remain in. One fire is designed to purify. The other fire will destroy. One fire is temporal. It's brief. The other fire is eternal, no end. One fire won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. The other fire will bring agony beyond imagination. 
One fire is a controlled burn for good. The other fire is a raging forest fire that will consume everything. Those who are found in Christ need not fear the latter fire, the second death, the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone for all eternity. But those that are found in Christ do have a fire to go through. They do have a fire to go through. It's the fiery trials that the Lord's ordained for them in this world. Not as proof of their salvation. Proof of our salvation is in Christ and through faith in Christ. Don't think that these fiery trials are designed to, to give you assurance. Well, I've, I got through that trial, that trouble, that fire, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm still believing God, so therefore I must be a believer. And you look to that experience as the hope of your salvation. No. No, that's not the design of these fires that the child of God goes through in this world. The design of these fires is to purify. To purify. To make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And to make us more dependent upon him. Zechariah chapter 13. Beginning at verse 8. And it shall come to pass... That in all the land, that's all the people, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. But the third part, the third part shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried, they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Now we have a Savior who is described in the scriptures as having feet of fine brass as were burned in a fire. The fiery wrath that's going to consume the two-thirds spoken of, and this is a distinguishing grace that God has given to to man. Two-thirds going to be consumed by a fire, going to be cut off. One-third is going to be tried with a fire, that's the church, that's his people. And the reason why we're not going to be cut off is because the Lord Jesus Christ has quenched, has quenched the fire of God's holy wrath for us. That fire's been put out. We're not, I, I, I don't want to bring this message in a way as to, 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 cause people to to fear hell and you know and just look for some escape from that um, that that fire has been put out and um, <clears throat> I, I want mo- most people in the world are like Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright they will avoid the fiery trials of faith in this life and sell their souls not knowing that the fire that's coming is much, much worse. Oh, it, well, it cannot be compared. It cannot be compared. Brethren, we have a deliverance, a deliverer from that fire. And... Um, <clears throat> Scripture makes it clear that our God is a consuming fire and that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. We don't want any part of that. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as our propitiation. The wrath of God has been put away. The fire has been 
put out. But there is a fire. There is a fire that every child of God will go through. But here's the good news. It won't hurt you. <laughs> you remember the Hebrew children? Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they had built a, 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 a golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar required everyone at the sound of the music to bow and worship that golden statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused. They refused. And uh, the governors who were jealous of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went and told Nebuchadnezzar, there's some men over here, the Jews, they're not going to bow down and worship. And Nebuchadnezzar brought them in. Is it true? Is it true? If at the sound of the music you bow down and worship me <laughs> and the gods of Babylon, uh, I'll let you go. But if you don't, I'm going to put you into the fiery furnace. And... Uh, and what did, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say to Nebuchadnezzar? 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 We're not going to bow to your God. And we know that our God is able to deliver us from that fire, and we are sure that he's going to deliver us from you. Either way. <laughs> Either way, he's going to deliver us from you. And Nebuchadnezzar, the scripture says, was, was infuriated over their over their rebellion. And so he ordered that the furnace be heated seven times. Seven times. I, I, several years ago, we lived in a small town in Alabama, and there was a steam plant in that town, um, a power plant that produced electricity by burning coal. And, and I don't know the details. Maybe somebody knows more about steam plants. But I remember there were three men three men that opened a furnace when it wasn't supposed to be opened and the fire came out and killed all three of them in that small town it consumed all three of them and i thought about that that's that's what happened here the the, the lord nebuchadnezzar took his strongest men and said bind them and throw them into the furnace and heat the furnace and when they opened the door to the furnace to put them in the fire consumed the men that put them in the furnace and then Nebuchadnezzar looked from wherever he was down into the furnace. And he said, did we not throw three men into the furnace? I see four. <laughs> and the fourth is like unto the Son of God. <laughs> and then he called out to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He told them to come out. And they came out. Not a hair on their head was singed. And the smell of smoke did not pass to their clothes. <laughs> and the ropes that bound them were loosed. <laughs> were loosed. That's, that's our hope. The Lord Jesus Christ is that fourth one. He's, gone with, he, he's not only gone through the fiery furnace for us, but he goes through every fire that he kindles for us now. He said, look, I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined. And I will try them as gold is tried. My brethren, whatever trials, whatever troubles God has ordained for you to pass through, just like with the Hebrew children, he's in that furnace with you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Turn to me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And what is the, what is the, the purpose of these trials? These fiery trials that the Lord has. He's kindled these fires. He passes us through them. Now, as I said, all men will experience one of two fires. I don't want anything to do with the second one. And here's our Lord encouraging his people to say, the one-third that I'm taking through the fire, I'm doing it to refine them. And they shall, <laughs> they shall cry out to me, and I will hear them. <laughs> 
And I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'm going to accomplish my purpose through the trials that I have ordained for them. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a lively hope. Oh, these trials, these fires that the Lord passes us through, um, they, they're not going to hurt us. Why? Because by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the consumption of the fire that he accomplished on Calvary's cross, we don't have to fear the wrath and judgment of God. That's why the scripture says the fear, spirit of fear is not of God, but of love, of love. And of a sound mind, a saved mind. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. <laughs> it's reserved. You have a reservation. <laughs> if you're in Christ, you have a reservation. Your name's already in the book. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the Lord is there with his, with his angels to welcome everyone who has a reservation reserved in heaven the lord jesus christ said you believe in god believe also in me in my father's house there are many mansions i go and prepare a place for you let he starts out with let not your heart be troubled let not your heart be troubled what are we troubled with? We're troubled with these trials, these fiery trials, the, these, these experiences in this life. Let, let not your heart be troubled. I go and prepare a place for you. And when the Lord Jesus Christ took his rightful place at the right hand of the majesty on high and sat down, proving that the work was finished, everything necessary for those reservations to be fulfilled were accomplished in the meantime you will be kept by the power of God you will be kept John, John said they went out from us because they were never of us you belong to God he's going to keep you through whatever trials whatever troubles you are kept by the power of God not by your determination <laughs> Not by your commitment, not even by your faith, by the power of God, by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice. We rejoice in the midst of the trials, though now for a season. If need be, and God knows when the need be's are. He knows exactly when the need be's are. In Hebrews chapter 12, it speaks, it compares God's correction of his children from our correction of our children and how we correct our children as best we can, and we often make mistakes. We either correct them too much or not enough or not at the right time. That's never the case with our Heavenly Father. He knows exactly what we need, exactly when, exactly how much. And though no trial is pleasant for the season, in due time it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's the purpose of it. I'm going to take you through. I'm going to, I'm going to try you like silver and like gold. And you're going to call out to me. In the midst of your trials. And I'm going to hear you. <laughs> and I'm going to be your God. And you're going to call me your God. And I'm going to call you my people. Wherein you greatly rejoice. Though now for a season. If need be. You are in heaviness. Through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith. 
being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. (laughs) There's the hope. There's the hope. The Lord's preparing us. Preparing us. And Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Now the world, like I said, they're going to be like Esau for one morsel of bread. I'm not going to go through those troubles in this. The troubles of faith, the troubles of... No. and, And they... They sacrifice their soul to that eternal fire in order to escape the temporal trials of faith. Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. (laughs) That's why James says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. (laughs) And patience, when it is complete, will make you perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Nothing. There's the purpose of it. Turn to me to that. We're right there in 1 Peter. Turn back just a couple of pages to James chapter 1. James verse 1, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. That's the one third that we just read of in Zechariah chapter 13. The 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Now this prophecy in Zechariah 13 was fulfilled literally in 70 A.D. The Roman Jewish War of 70 A.D. when the Romans came in, they slaughtered two-thirds of all the Jews. And a third of them scattered. But that's a spiritual picture. Because we're the scattered Jews. (laughs) We're... (laughs) We're the true Jew who's been circumcised in the heart by the Spirit and the true children of Abraham who believe what Abraham believed. And so and so he says, he addresses himself, James, I'm a servant of God. <laughs> now, James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, I think that if I was James, I would have wanted people to know that. And I grew up with him. No, Holy Spirit wouldn't allow James to do that. He said, I'm a, I'm a bondservant. My brethren, my brethren, all the one-third scattered abroad, all those whom God is passing through the temporal fire of trials in order to perfect their faith, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Different and different. (laughs) What Scott Richardson once said, he said, uh, he said, every child of God's either in trouble, going into trouble, or coming out of trouble. And isn't that the way it is? Troubles and troubles change, don't they? The Lord gets us through one fire and, and then he takes us through another, and then another, and then another. And we falsely believe somehow, you know, there's going to come a day when all these trials are going to be over and I'm going to be able to live my life out with, 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 with lack of conflict. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. That's what the Lord's saying to us. So he said, there's going to be trials. And when this one passes, there'll be another one. <laughs> and, and it'll be, Paul called them necessities. <laughs> necessities if need be that what we peter said if need be they're all necessary knowing this and you know this 
that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. (laughs) That you might be brought to that place to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want of anything else. He's all I need. (laughs) He's all I need. To quote Scott Richardson again, someone asked him one time, he said, he said, is Jesus all you need? He said, if he's all you've got, he's all you need. If he's all you've got. And that's that's the reason the Lord is the Lord is showing us how how temporal and how meaningless this world is and that we cast all our care upon him who cares for us you say well i don't understand i I lack wisdom up if any man lack wisdom let him ask it of god who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth it not but let him ask in faith nothing wavering not like the waves of the sea tossed here and fro what is, that, what is it to be double-minded? And he goes on to say, for a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I feel double-minded most of the time. But that's not what he's talking about. Being double-minded is thinking that I can do something to make God be merciful to me. In other words, it's having a, it's having a grace works mentality. It's mixing grace with works. And what are the purpose of the trials? To show us that it's all of grace and all of Christ. No works. No works. Lord, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> I told somebody recently, I said, pray like this. Just tell, Lord, if you don't save me, I won't be saved. If you don't save me, I will not be saved. You're going to have to do it. Turn to me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to bring him through the fire. (laughs) But the fire will not hurt them. The smell of smoke will not be on their clothing. I'm going to walk through the fire with them. I'm going to loose their bonds in the fire. See, we're bound. uh, We're... we're, uh, what binds us is a works is a is a works mentality, isn't it? It's thinking that you know I can do something to to make God bless me, or I can, I, you know, I I can force the hand of God. I can bargain with God somehow. And how binding that is! Never knowing if you've done enough, or how much you need to do, or when to do it, or how well you've done it. 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 12, look at verse 7. And least I should, be, I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given to me. <laughs> Paul's saying, I, I've been given an abundance of... Paul was caught up into the third heaven. I, he saw things that were unspeakable. He couldn't, he couldn't describe what he saw. And the Lord had given him a revelation of himself and of the gospel beyond measure. And Paul said, lest I should become proud that this revelation that God has given me <laughs> is somehow I, I, you know, it makes me better than anybody else or somehow I earned it or deserved it. Lest I should think that way, God gave me a thorn in my flesh. Satan has buffeted me. Now, there's been a lot of speculation among men as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. And the Spirit of God doesn't tell us. And I think I know why. I think I know why. Because I've got a thorn in my flesh. And it is my flesh. It's my flesh.
He's given me, verse 7, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. (laughs) You see, brethren, every one of us has got a thorn in the flesh, lest we should become exalted above measure. These are the fiery trials. These are the troubles that we have. What did, what did Rebecca say when, the, when, when Esau and Jacob were, were fighting in her womb? She said, Lord, why am I thus? Why am I thus? Why is this conflict going on within me? And what did the Lord say? Because there are two nations in you. <laughs> You're two nations in you. And the, and, and, and the older will serve the younger. And the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. What's the Lord do? When, when, when silver and gold is tried by fire, it's put into a, into a little bowl, a little crucible, and heated just to the right temperature so that the dross separates from the metal. And, they, and they, the man that's doing it or the woman that's doing it, is, what, what are they doing? They're patiently taking the dross comes to the surface. <laughs> and they're patiently skimming it off. And how do they know when, they're, when the process is finished? <laughs> when there's no more dross. When the dross is at the surface of the metal, it distorts any image. When it's pure silver and pure gold, the, the, the person can look down there and see a reflection of themselves without any distortion. That's what the Lord's doing one day. One day. You see, there's going to be dross in our gold and our silver as long as we're in this flesh. That's our thorn in the flesh. One day the Lord's going to, going to see a perfect image of himself. We're going to see a perfect image of him. <laughs> and we're going to be made like him. See him as he is, the fullness of his glory. Well, the Lord's encouraging his people. He's just saying to them, hey, you know, one third, one third, my people, two thirds are going to be cut off. And they're going to be they're going to suffer a fire that's eternal. And one third, I'm going to show them my mercy. And they're going to pass through a fire. And I'm going to try them like silver and try them like gold, but they're not going to be consumed by it. They're going to be purified by it. And it'll be good for them. It'll be good for them. They won't. You know, in another place, the Lord said that wood, hay, and stubble gets consumed by fire, but precious, precious metal doesn't get consumed by fire. It gets purified. So, so Paul says, there's a thorn in my flesh. In verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might, be depart, that it might depart from me. Lord, take this, take this away from me. How many times we've prayed that? There's a good little article in your bulletin, I think, by Philpot uh, this morning. Uh, Lord, take it away. Take it away. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. (laughs) What's the purpose of the fire? And we're going through now to show us our weakness. And Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. (laughs) His strength is made perfect in my weakness. I would depend upon my strength. If it wasn't for these fiery trials. Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches. In necessities. In persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak then I am strong. (laughs) That's what the world doesn't know anything about. They see... They see arrogance, control as strength. You know, my, the intimidation is strength. What's the Lord say? No, strength is found in your weakness. When, you, when you're brought by these trials to bow in submission to me, then you're going to discover my strength. Paul said, I'm a glory in my infirmities if that be the case. (laughs) 
Uh, let's, go, let's go in closing to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. They're going to call me their God. What, what's our text say? They will cry out to me. I'm going to put just enough heat on them to make them cry out. <laughs> and when they cry out, they will cry out. I'm going to make them cry out. And I will hear them. <laughs> and I shall be their God. And they will be my people. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. We know. We do know that all things work together for good for them that love God. Not going to be good for everybody. No, they've got a fire to go through. Well, they're not going to go through it. They're going to remain in it and be cast into it, never to be delivered. That fiery wrath and judgment of God is eternal. But you know, for you that love God, you who are the called according to his purpose, all things for you are going to work together for good. For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the purpose of it all. The purpose of it all is to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. You see, in the in the in eternity, we're already conformed to the image of His Son. We, as He is, so are we. And and right now, the Lord, we're already glorified, already glorified. When we step into glory, draw our last breath in this world. We're going to discover we've always been there. For what shall we then say to these things? What are we going to say to these things? Here's what we say. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Notice the personal pronouns here. Not for them all, but for us all. The two-thirds are cut off. God makes a distinction between us and them. And he says, He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I prepared a place for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril of the sword? Shall any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Now that's what the world doesn't want anything to do with. That's what they don't want. They will choose the eternal fire of hell rather than being killed every day. And the child of God knows what I'm talking about. God has to put you to death every day, doesn't he? How's he do it? Through trying you as with silver and as with gold. Showing you your weakness Causing you to cry out to him to be your God. Dying to yourself every day. 
That's what the world doesn't want anything to do with. Dying to your righteousness. Dying to any hope of salvation outside of what God has done in justifying you through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the world doesn't want anything to do with. And they will choose an eternal fire of judgment rather than go through that fire. Nay, in all these things. Now, what did he say? The last part of that last verse was, we're like sheep to the slaughter. We're, that's what the world doesn't want anything to do with it. A sheep? A dumb sheep? I'm not a sheep. I'm a bull. Well, you go ahead and be a bull. Because the bulls of Bashan are going to end up in the pit of fire. I'll be a sheep. A dumb sheep dependent upon my shepherd. Through all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. Can you say this? I'm persuaded. And God has persuaded me through the fiery trials that he's taken me through. And he's proven himself to be faithful through every one of those. And I've cried out to him and he's answered me. And I've called him my God and he's called me my people. He's been faithful and merciful to me. And therefore I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. (laughs) Which is in Christ Jesus. Two fires. There are two fires. All men will experience one or the other. I choose the former, don't you? (laughs) I don't want anything to do with that latter fire. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon me. All right, let's take a break.